At this time, we're going to receive some new members. Some, late, some people have came to our class here a week ago, and I'm going to invite you to come up front. We want to introduce you this morning, if you would. Come at this time, yes. <laughs> Amen. So, y'all can stand over here. That's good. I'm going to let you just, yeah, come on up. And you may know some of them, you may not. So I'm just going to ask everybody to tell us their name. Jeanette Price. Ryan Price. Dave Freyma. Don Westover. And Pam Pergandy. Amen. Can you give them a round of applause? Yes. So glad to have them with us. I'm going to ask those of the elders that are here, if you would, to come up and shake their hands and welcome them formally into the church. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, well, we want to welcome you anyway. <laughs> Amen. You may have a seat. Yes. Yes. Amen. All right. It is the big week. Next Saturday morning at 9 o'clock is the resurrection breakfast, okay? Now then, uh, Dan's going to say more about this at the end of the service, but we have these cards, and here's what we'd like for you to do with it. If you know someone... Someone you work with, friend, loved one, even an enemy. If you want them to come and get saved, that's okay too. Um, if you give them a card on the back here, it can say friend of. And if you put your name there, then we will let them in and we know that you're going to pay for them. And it's a way that you don't have to worry about it. And we invite you to do that. If you don't have the money, put my name there, okay? I'm willing to pay for a few folks to come. And we're going to be starting next. If you want to, there are a lot of things you can do. First of all, I ask everybody to be praying this week that uh, we'll have a good crowd. We've got a great speaker, David Smith. He's going to be coming. And if you know someone, be praying for them and uh, invite them to come and be here. If you want to work, uh, we're asking our workers to try and be here between 6.30 and 7. If you can't be here until 8, that's okay, too. Whenever you show up, we'll put you to work, okay? And even some of you ladies, if you want to come and help, a lot of times they will come, and if you'll see my wife, Sheila, they'll come at 9 and help do all the stuff while the meeting itself is going on, and they're tremendous help in all of that. So we want everybody to come and be a part of this and come and bring someone with you. Amen. Brother Dan will be talking about that more. This morning, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. this morning we're going to be talking about when Jesus enters Jerusalem. And before someone tells me, yes, I know it's not Palm Sunday, that's next week. But I'm going to speak about it today, if that's okay. And uh, in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied 
on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. There are several noteworthy things in this passage which signify change. The first is a change in strategy. As we've read through the Gospel of Mark up to this point, before this time, Jesus has encouraged silence. He's told people, he's healed people, and he's told them, don't talk about this. He's said different things to people, and he said, don't talk about this. So there has been a period here where he's downplayed everything that he's done. It's, it's almost like he's, he doesn't want anybody to be talking about it. And of course, a lot of people ignored him. And they've been talking about it anyway because that's just sort of human nature. All of us, when we have a, a good new story to tell, we can't wait to find someone to tell it. But now, there's a change. Now, a spectacle is arranged. There's really no other word that you can talk about, describe it. We see it's played out. Jesus sends his disciples there to get a colt and bring it to him. This is the one and only time that we see that Jesus doesn't walk. Unusual. We see that there is a crowd of people. They're before him, they're after him, they're with him. They're cutting down palm branches, they're laying them in the street, they're waving them. It's a spectacle. Jesus here is arranging things and what we see here is that there's a change in strategy because it is time for Jesus to accomplish his task. It's the time. There's an emphasis on time here. We need to understand as we look at this, and we say, well, that's great, I understand that. We need to understand that also there is a time for us that God works in our lives that God moves in our lives and that there is a, an appropriate time for things to happen. Most of us think in terms of the mountaintop experiences where God is strong and His presence is strong. But again, what He's describing here and what I want you to think about is 
God has called us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. He's called us to be followers. He's called us then to go on a journey. And we see many of the parallels here in this story with our journey. And what that tells us is that in our own journey, there is a time to be quiet. I know this is a new revelation for some people. They struggle with that concept, being quiet. I know for others, they think, well, that's just the way I... Some people are so quiet, you wonder, are they even here? But there's a time to be silent, and there's a time to cry out. Solomon expressed it so beautifully in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. That very poetic passage. There's a time to speak. There's a time to be quiet. We see that here echoed in the ministry of Jesus. There was the time when we're not going to talk about this a whole lot. And then there's the time to shout it from the rooftop. There is the time to proclaim it in the street. There is that time when it's almost an explosion that God has on Jerusalem. This is the beginning of a what many consider the most important week of human history. Where after this week, nothing will be the same. Jerusalem will never be the same. The world will never be the same. And when God steps into your life, you will never be the same. And so it's an announcement. It is the time for Jesus to do. He's tried to tell his disciples over and over, this is what's going to happen. They don't want to hear it. He's tried to preach it to the world. They do not want to hear it. Whether we want to hear it or not, though, it is the time for God to move. The other thing here is, there are two kinds of prophecy. When you read the other Gospels, they tend to emphasize the old prophecy. Mark barely touches upon it. The first prophecy, or the old prophecy, is the 500-year-old prophecy of Zechariah. 500 years or so before this event happened, Zechariah had prophesied that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem riding upon this animal. Now, it's important to recognize that there are times that where God is working His will and working His way through human history, and sometimes we're going to be a small part of it. Because God has this huge picture. God thinks in terms of, as we see here, 500 years. As Peter would say, a thousand years is as one day to the Lord. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, are tied up in the plan and the purpose of God. How do we know this? Because we're human. And God has done this for the human race. As it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. It is for the benefit of the world. It is for our benefit. It is for our purpose. And so you have the events taking place here, but then also, and it's interesting what Mark concentrates on. 
Mark doesn't concentrate on what Zechariah has to say. What Mark concentrates on is the immediate prophecy of Jesus. Did you notice it when I was reading it? It was quick. He wasn't talking about in terms of 500 years. He's talking about in terms of less than 30 minutes. He tells two of his disciples, they're close to two villages, so we don't even know which village they went into. He points it out to them, the one opposite you, whichever one, Bethany or Bethphage, we don't know. And he said, I want you to go in there, and as you go in to the village, you're going to find an animal there. He describes the animal that's going to be tied up. It's going to be an animal that has never been ridden by anybody and I want you to get it. Now it's a prophecy because he knows that the animal is going to be there. It's a prophecy because he knows what kind of animal it is. It's a prophecy because he knows the condition of the animal. But even more so he knows a prophecy because he knows somebody is going to say something. And he tells them. And it's interesting what he says here. He says, when someone asks you, sort of, you know, just sort of imagine if you'd left the keys in your automobile outside and someone walked up and got in and started to drive off and you say, wait. And their response is, the Lord has need of it. Now, do you understand all that's been going on and working and happening in order for this to happen? You see, not only does Jesus tell them what is going to happen and what to do, but that means that God is also working on the other end because this was a valuable animal in prime condition. And you're just going to let someone take it? That means that God, through, and, and, and here's one of those untold stories that the Bible alludes to that we don't know. That John said, you know, if we wrote down everything, we just could, we'd just spend all of our time writing. The world could not contain it all. You see, God had to have been working on the other end. God had to be preparing the owner of this animal. God had to be putting in their heart, telling them somehow, some way, I don't know, did they have a visitation by an angel? Did they have a dream? Did they have a vision? We don't know. We just know that when they heard those words, the Lord has need of it, they said, okay, take it. Now, what's important about this, now Mark is emphasizing it because, again, this is, as we said, it's the action gospel. Most people don't care about, they think 500-year-old stuff, oh, that's, that's good. The problem with 500-year-old stuff is, though, we don't know when it's going to happen. But, man, when you get down inside of 30 minutes, wow, this is immediate. Same God, though. Same God working long distance, same God working short distance, same God working over hundreds of years and centuries and eons, and the same God that's working in just a few moments in your life. It's the same God. And what that tells us is God has a plan. God has a plan. We were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. Most of us have a messed up prayer life because we think, I have got to figure out how God can do this. I've got to tell God exactly 
what to do. You realize you don't have to do that. And you realize that most of the people that do it get it wrong. I'll give you, the, to my mind, the most famous example, Abraham. Abraham took, when God commanded him and told him, I want you to go and I want you to slay your son, your only son Isaac, on the place that I will show you. Abraham, it tells us in Hebrews, had reasoned it out and he said, well, this is the only way that God can do it. God has to go through these particular steps here. I will go through. I will obey God. He'd already decided this is what I'm going to do. I've messed up enough in my life and made enough big mistakes that I have learned when God says to do something, I will do it. And so I will kill my son and then God must raise him from the dead. Because God has promised me that through this son, all the earth will be blessed and my descendants will be as the stars in the sky and the sand upon the scene. So he had worked it out and he had figured out in his mind the only way that God could do it. Did God do it that way? No. All that figuring, all that planning, and God had another way. You see, Zechariah had had the prophecy and he had said, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have an animal that's never been written and the Messiah is going to ride in. But he didn't have a few details. He didn't have the details on how the animal was going to get to Jesus. He didn't have the details on who was going to supply the animal. He didn't have the details on which of the disciples, and again, we're not told which ones. We're just told there are two of them. We're not told which ones went to get it. You see, God has a plan for your whole lifetime, and God has a plan for the next 30 minutes. And the more that we think about that, the more amazed we should be. Now, God has a plan, and yet we spend so much of our time trying to figure out how God is going to do something. It's just like we spend most of our time worrying about things that will never happen. I remember back when Sheila's parents were alive, we went over there to see them one day and shortly after we were married. And all they could talk about is how one of them forgot to lock the door the night before. And that's what they talked about. And they said, this could have happened and that could have happened and this could have happened and that could have happened. I had learned enough wisdom to keep my mouth shut But I wanted to say, you know, nothing happened. You're okay. You're safe. A lot of stuff could have happened. A lot of bad people could have come in. But nothing happened. You know why? Because... We worry about things, and you know, sometimes God's looking out when we mess up. And sometimes God protects us when we can't even protect ourselves. And sometimes God has a plan, and we don't even have a clue as to what God is doing. And so the story then becomes relevant to us today. Because it teaches us that God has a plan. We move on. And the other contrast that we have here is what I call the triumph and the temple. 
Now, the triumph we've already talked about. Jesus comes in. He's riding upon the colt. The crowd is praising God. They're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're singing the praises. They're waving the palm branches. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're shouting. It is an event. It's a spectacle, like I said. And Jesus has helped arrange it. Because the crowd shouts praises at Jesus. The contrast here, and never lose sight of it, a lot in this same crowd is shouting praises on this day. By the end of the week, some of them will be saying, crucify him. Crowds are fickle. Crowds don't always stay on message. They change quickly. So we have this wonderful spectacle. Jesus is riding in. The disciples are following. They're looking around. They're going, wow, we've had a change in strategy. Wow, things are different. And they're probably thinking, they're forgetting, you know, all about the stuff that Jesus, all the bad stuff that Jesus is trying to be prepping them for for days. And they're thinking, we are okay now. Not knowing. Things will change quickly. The crowd shouts praises at Jesus. But did you notice how this passage closes? It closes very differently. You've got the crowd, they're yelling, they're praising, they're doing wonderful things, they're singing, they're chanting. Everything is good, everything is wonderful. But then it just tells us that Jesus walks into the temple and looks around. Doesn't say anything. There's no crowd here, there's no chanting, there's no praising, there's none of the other stuff Jesus walks into the temple and looks around. There's a contrast here. You've got the crowd. You've got the temple. The crowd is noisy. The temple appears to be silent. The people are looking at Jesus outside. Now Jesus is looking around. Again, what is signifying here is there's a change that is coming. You see, the temple represented for the nation of Israel the holiest structure. It was designed to separate segregate it was designed to impress upon people when you look at the original temple of solomon i mean this was the temple of herod and it was nice but it didn't even compare to the temple of solomon the temple of solomon there was gold everywhere and silver and all sorts of stuff There was, on the outside, the court of the Gentiles. There was a sign on the door basically warning them, if you're not Jewish, do not pass this door, you will be killed. There was a court of the women, and the women knew, we stay here, this is our area. There was the court of the men, and again, it was separated, and here's where the men could go. And then... There in the heart of the temple. And when Jesus is looking around, no doubt he sees it and he's looking at it. There is the most holy place. And later that week, it would change. The most holy place, the high priest would go in there 
once a year. He would wear his garment had bells on the hem so that people could hear him walking around. There would be a rope tied to one of his ankles in the case that God slew him, they would not go in and get him. They would pull his dead body out of there. That's how holy that place was. Later that week, on that afternoon, when Jesus would finally die and give up his spirit, the Bible tells us but that curtain that separated the most holy place from the rest of the temple would be torn in two. Jesus is going into the temple and he's looking around because he understands the purpose of this building is almost done. It's interesting how Mark describes it. It's both literal and symbolic. It says, the hour is late. The hour is late. It's late in the day. But it's also late in the history of the temple. Within a week, the purpose of this temple will be finished. It will be complete. All the barriers will be torn aside. All the sacrifices will basically come to an end as far as God is concerned because the ultimate sacrifice is about to be offered. And so Jesus is looking at the temple and he's looking around. And the hour is late. The hour is late in the life of Jesus. The events are coming to an end. The hour is late in the life of Israel. The hour is late for the temple. The hour is late for the world. Change is about to happen. The blood of Christ is about to be offered. The world will change. All of creation will change. Because that event that God, he talked about things for 500 years. Acts tells us that before Adam was ever created, God knew what he was going to do. And that which God had planned long ago is about to come to an end. Why is that important for us? It's important for us to realize that sometimes, here's a thought for you, as we prepare over the next two weeks to prepare for is Easter. God most definitely had a plan for Jesus. Do you understand why Jesus came? Multiple reasons. One of the reasons was Jesus came to show us how to live. He said, I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. And he said, even as the Father hath sent me, so I send you. God had a plan for Jesus. I'm here to remind you this morning, God has a plan for you. He knows. He thinks in terms of your lifetime, but also he thinks in terms of less than a half hour. He can do both ways. God has a plan for you. The question I would leave you with this morning is, are you working with that plan or are you fighting against it?
That is the struggle. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have given to us. Lord, I just want to pray for your people this morning. Lord, there may be some here who are struggling with different things. Lord, I pray that they would feel your peace this morning and understand that you know what they're going through, that you have a plan for them, that you see what they need. Help us, God, to see you as the source and our strength and our shield and our comfort and our hope and our very life. Help us to see that, God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand, please. Did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on both a donkey and a colt? Uh, yes, but it's one and the same animal, okay? All right. Did Jesus do this simply to fulfill the prophecy? Is it Mark's account proof that Jesus didn't orchestrate this just to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy? Well, you're getting into here. Jesus would have been familiar with Zechariah's prophecy. And yet what we see is that God, remember what he says. When Jesus was born as a baby, he is by nature God. But as Paul says, he has emptied himself of a lot of his powers of God. And one of those would have been omniscience, all-knowing. So Jesus had to read the prophecy of Zechariah, just like all of us. The difference would have been he would have known within himself, this is about me. But then the exact way that it's going to happen is not revealed to him until the time that it happens. So it's not that Jesus is orchestrating the one who's orchestrating it is God. And Jesus is, at this point, the servant of God, working and showing himself. Because Jesus didn't do any of his miracles through himself or through his own power. That's why there are no miracles until after the Holy Spirit descends upon him at the baptism of John. Because Jesus cannot say to us, even as the Father sent me, so I send you, if Jesus is doing things through his own power, through his own abilities, he's doing it as an example to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, anyway, Brother Dan, come.